In this episode, I am once again joined by Lionel Snell, a contemporary English magician, publisher, and under various pen names such as Ramsey Dukes, a renowned author on magic and philosophy. Lionel explores the idea that people, societies, and even cultures cycle through four distinct phases with profound effects. Lionel traces the history of the last hundreds and even thousands of years and identifies the emergence of these phases with periods of religious fervor, scientific progress, magical revivals, and artistic eruption. Lionel explains the similarities and differences between magic and art, the archetypes of the feminine, and the fear of the free woman. Lionel also provides analysis of our current time, reveals how finding the trickster can unravel polarized and dualistic thinking, and how a deep understanding of the occult can be noted in leading political and cultural figures. So without further ado, Lionel Snell. Lionel Snell, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. Pleasure to be back. Well, I'm so delighted to be talking with you again. And goodness me, that first episode we recorded received overwhelmingly positive feedback. I had emails and messages um, of all sorts of people who have been influenced by your work and admirers of yours and uh, even some colleagues of yours who spoke very fondly of you and were delighted to see you being interviewed uh, on the podcast. So it was a, a great pleasure and I'm so happy that we're doing a sequel. And I, I mentioned that um, I went uh, to my acupuncturist for treatment and he looked at me and he said, short while ago i was hearing you being interviewed on a podcast with my viking guru so that was um yeah he was very surprised so yeah. was i yeah and so was i when you told me <laughs> it's the wonders of the internet yeah mm. well we left the last episode we covered a great deal in that episode actually uh, a great deal about your own life path and trajectory began our uh, exploration of of your thought and writing mm. in the field of magic and we ended beginning to talk about this idea of, of cycles. And you write about this, I think, quite extensively in SSOTBME, hmm. this book. Sex Secrets of the Black All Magicians the black. Exposed. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you I write... Mean, a, cheek. <laughs> of course, yes. You write a, a, quite, a, a, quite a bit about that. And the four, I suppose, modes are magic, art, religion and science and you apply those to a person a person may go through phases in which one of those modes is dominant and then eventually that mode will give way to another which will in in turn give way to another you also talk about cycles of fashion and also cycles of thought in which the broader culture uh, moves through a certain dominance of be it magic, artistic, religious, scientific, and so on. And you've mapped that actually in the last couple of hundred years. So I'm very curious about that. Uh, and there's some other, other applications of the cycles too, so interpersonal communication and so on that I would like to ask you about. Could you perhaps give us an introduction to this idea and to your thinking on this? And then in particular, I, I'm curious about this idea of personal cycles, but also in particular, the cycles of thought, where we are, how we got here, and what's coming next? Well, I'd like to start with a sort of, um, I know we call it a health warning, but um, scientism is generally against the idea of cycles. And it goes back to, um, I can't remember the name of the Greek philosopher, you know, about two and a half thousand years ago, who said no man could ever step into the same river twice. Do you remember who that was? Um, it's a well-known saying. Yes, isn't it Heraclitus? I think that's it, yes, yeah. yeah. And the idea being, and this was the beginning of the, the atom theory, that everything is made of atoms. And so you step into the river and the water, atoms of water are flowing past. Now, when you go there the next year, it won't be exactly the same atoms or the same arrangement of atoms. Therefore, it's not the same river. So that, um, you could say, clashes with the fact that Every year I used to go with my family to the River Severn and take a boat out. And so as far as we were concerned, every year we're going back to the same river. But um, the, so there's this um, schism between thinking in cycles 
and thinking of time as a linear thing. It just flows and flows and will never come back. Being brought up in the deep country without electricity in that, I was very much aware of cycles because, you know, obviously day, night, day, night, day, night has got a rhythm to it. But also the moon, you know, the full moon and, and the cycle of the moon. And the cycle of the year is very obvious when you're living in the country, you know, the springtime and, and so on and so forth. So thinking in cycles comes quite naturally to me. And I think most people can think in cycles. But there is this, uh, um, it makes scientists very suspicious very often if you talk of cycles. I know someone who did um, a very elaborate mathematical research into sunspot cycles. And he was looking for their effects on the, on the business, um, you know, the, the, the money markets. Um, and he, very detailed work, he did a lot of research, but it's the sort of thing that would, would get published in many magazines because they say, oh, cycles, that's crank stuff. So there's sort of um, two ways of looking at it. Now, one thing that I don't think of cycles as like clockwork, you know, this will happen, therefore this. To me, it's more like um, the seasons or the wind. Um, in other words, you can't say on this day, this is going to change, um, but rather um, there's a shift like the weather sort of shift. And if you look at it from sort of stepping back, you can see a change taking place and you can recognize a cycle. If someone's very critical, they say, well, when did it begin exactly? You know, oh, what about this? This doesn't fit it. This doesn't fit it. It's a question of almost aesthetically seeing a rhythm and a pattern um, in a cycle. So I, I just say that because, um, as you say, there is this resistance to the idea of cycles. Now, the one that was most obvious to me was um, I lived from the 50s to the 60s when there was a, a magical revival. Suddenly, in the 50s, you know, to talk about magic, to think about magic was really loony stuff. You know, and, and, and you didn't do that. But by the end of the 60s, you know, which, which people were confessing to be witches on television, all that sort of thing. So there was definitely a magical revival. And what struck me is that there was a similar magical revival in Victorian times. End of the Victorian era was very much a magical revival. Then you sort of look at what happened before and after, because say we went from a very skeptical scientific um, rationalist world of the 50s, and then we got this um, magical revival happening. And a similar thing happened in Victorian times that um, uh, you had Darwin, the discovery of electricity, and science was the buzz. Uh, people would go to a theater to see a demonstration of science, you know, electric effects and things like that. And then, fin de siècle, you've got this rise of the occult and fascination and, and sort of vampire stories and all that type of thing, the Gothic thing. So it happened two times. And that sort of lied, uh, that, that denied this sort of idea that oh, once we understand science, we know we've been educated it, we can't possibly go back to that magic lunacy. Um, because, uh, yeah. <laughs> We'd gone from the one to the other at a popular level, a sort of fashion cycle. And then um, what happened after that uh, in the 20th century, after the Victorian magical revival, you had the period of the 20s. When I say the period of the 20s, it didn't just fit the 20s like that, but it was typified by the 20s. New artistic movements, um, you know, cinema was beginning to, began as a sort of a technical marvel, but it became an art form in that period. And um, a lot of uh, yeah, dance crazes and things like that. Now, if I look back before the scientific period in the Victorian times, there was a similar thing happening. The town near where I lived was a spa town, which was built in the early 1800s. And it was a place of fashion, you know, and people coming for the spa, it was a trendy thing to do. It was very much like the buzz of um, uh, the 80s and um, the buzz of the 20s, you know, the sort of uh, frenzy of money making and getting rich and spending and all that sort of thing. So there definitely seems to be a sort of sequence there. And what happened in Victorian times is, is 
after this sort of money making thing, there was a big crash. And the people became very religious. They started confessing. And so when I wrote that, I was saying, um, I was predicting that I would expect a sort of religious revival. And then we had that um, in the decade of evangelism, uh, which was um, towards the end of the 20th century, 1900s, decade, so 1990s, decade of evangelism. So it really seemed as though there was this sort of rhythm with continuing. And then, of course, the whole skeptical movement um, was inspired by people like Richard Dawkins, who was very strong in the early 21st century. And I'm aware that we've moved on from there, and it currently there's much more interest in magic, astrology, and um, uh, it's, it's the, the occult is beginning to get a little bit of respectability in academia. You know, you could talk about, call it esotericism to make it a bit more formal. So I think this cycle is continuing, but it's not a thing that, you know, some people say, ah, oh, it's the new age, you know, now we're all spiritual, we understand magic and things like that. I'm sure it too will go out of fashion and there'll be a, probably another sort of artistic frenzy phase, you know, and, um, and so on. So that's, that's one cycle, which was sort of very obvious. And in a way, I could see it in my own life because um, as a little child, I'd gone through a sort of childish artistic period. And then I remember sort of, I think, about nine, 10, 11, of being rather religious with a little boy who prays by his bed every night and things like that. Then a very skeptical time in the, um, my teenagerhood, you know, when uh, uh, the scripture master would say, you know, um, make some religious statement and I'll say, prove it, you know. Um, and then by the time I went to university, I became very interested in the occult again. So um, I, I'm very much aware we seem to go through those patterns. And in, in one book, My Years of Magical Thinking, I try to see reasons why this change would tend to take place. And again, it's not like, you know, the clock ticks and we now move into the next phase, the next phase automatically. It's I think that um, religion and science are very good at telling you what you can't do. Or rather, religion says what you should do. You know, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, this, that, the other. And science um, says there are things you can't do. You know, you can't levitate, you can't read minds, this, that, the other. And um, when you've gone through the phases of, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that, I think the human nature has a strong impulse. Well, you say, I can't do it, but I want to do it. You know, I want to do the impossible. And that is, for some people, that's all, all that magical thinking means. Oh, it's, it's people trying to want to do the impossible. But if you think of it, that's actually a very important part of human nature. If you think in evolutionary terms, you know, sort of why has Homo sapiens become such a dominant species? One of the remarkable things is um, the number of people who set out to do the impossible, you know, whether it's to climb Everest, there was very good evidence that you can't climb Everest. So many dead people who tried, but someone was so determined he did it. And then what was considered impossible is now considered possible. Then it was, you can't do it without oxygen, but people have since gone up without oxygen. You know, it's always pushing the boundaries and science itself advances that way. I know as a kid, I used to be very irritated because I, I love those books, you know, the wonders of science, um, children's book, boys book of science sort of thing. But uh, they always had an airplane on the cover. But I was aware that um, when the Wright brothers made their first flight, they invited the scientific establishment of merit to come and witness the fight. And no one came because the scientific establishment knew that heavier than air flight was impossible. It couldn't work, but it did, you see. But now it's claimed as a sort of victory of science. As far as I'm concerned, the, um, the Wright brothers did a good bit of magic getting up there. <laughs> so, um, so I do have a feeling of why these changes happen. It's a sort of you know, human need to move on to um, something else. I feel 
magic is very much about um, expressing sort of things you could say from your unconscious you you express something with a ritual or you make a talisman a wish is somehow transferred out into material things now that is very much a private thing you do you know you do a little spell or make a talisman in secret it's very normal in magic to do it secretly because that helps contain the energy and all that and always strikes me that um if say you have done a ritual or, or no, say made a talisman a painting you painted a talisman if someone says sees it and says wow that's really powerful i love it uh you realize the thing that you did for yourself has actually got value for other people and to me that's the sort of transition from magic to art that um when you have done some piece of magic or made some object a, a, a sacred object or a um whatever and other people see it as hugely valuable that bit of magic has moved into art so art is very much about doing something which is basically magical and i think many people would agree with that i know that um uh yeah some people say art is magic it is true in the sense it begins with a sort of a magical act of creation but what the difference is is that other people society values it and recognizes it and that makes it more art and so on you know in those sort of terms i can say why these cycles uh you know the sort of reason these cycles take place why one thing should choose tune into another and once i started looking for them i could see them at other levels and um if i look back to the beginning of the what they call the aquarian age you know zero a.d the 500 years before that had been very rational um, and the interesting thing was it happened all around the world there's a very good book by karen armstrong where she talks about what she called the uh what was it the um the axial age and it happened in uh greece with things like that statement we've quoted you know about um uh no, never stepping into the same river twice the atom theory which was very much a, a new movement which attacked the old religious and magical ideas and talked in terms of atoms and certainties and that was very strong for the 500 years bc um but the same thing was happening in china uh, there was a very rational um movement then where they said things like this whole idea of lucky days is ridiculous because if a ship sinks does it mean everyone on that boat just happen to have the same cycle of lucky days you know it's ridiculous same sort of arguments you would have heard in the 1950s um but uh, and also it's a similar thing in india was recorded but when it came to uh the early um the, cent you know, the centuries after that early ad it was a big revival of magical thinking as i see it a lot of the things the astrology um what had been astronomy began to be personalized as astrology in that time and a famous example which holmyard who did the um, history of alchemy draws attention to was that um uh people think of Will always quote chemist as alchemy as being the sort of forerunner of chemistry you know the primitive mumbo jumbo version which became chemistry but uh in the history of alchemy i read that the before the um the bc times the, the technology of metallurgy was pretty well developed and it was quite the exact science you know you you put certain things together a certain way and um with certain proportions that's it's all measured out but it became so important politically the counterfeiting of, of gold coins that the rulers um forbade that knowledge from being handed around and this was like the burning of the 
the um, library at Alexandria, a you know, sort of a clamp down on this open dissemination of truth and sharing of ideas, which happened around that time. And they say what happened is alchemy became, the chemistry became more mystical. It was secret. It had to be put into code and things like that. And the whole spirit of it changed into this sort of what we think of as alchemy. You know, what had been science actually became a mystical study of alchemy. And there are many other examples. The Greek medicine at that time was called the silent art because when you went to a doctor, he didn't speak to you and listen to you. Instead, he looked at the symptoms because speaking and talking was linked up with necromancy, not necromancy, but, you know, um, magical incantations, that sort of thing. So it was done in silence. He said, no, I'm just going to look at the symptoms. Just as um, in, in recent years, if you go to a specialist, he doesn't spend a lot of time telling you how you're feeling and all that. He gets out the x-rays, he gets out the blood tests and things like that. And that's what he bases judgment on. So that was how it was in Greek medicine. But when you got to the um, centuries after that, you got a whole birth of um, what we would call holistic medicine. You went to a, a healing place, Icyclopean, I think they called them. And they would first think night you were there, they would ask you about your dreams. And then you would have a really holistic experience. You, know, you would have water therapy, you would have psychotherapy, acting out dramas on a stage, you would have herbs, this, that, and the other. It was, um, <laughs> so this sort of change, um, this 500 year change, I could see. And I, I similarly followed that sort of pattern through and I saw how something similar happened throughout the last 2000 years, for lots of 500 years. Now, I don't want to go into great detail about it because it's the sort of thing which it's interesting to see this pattern, but you're not trying to sort of persuade people that, you know, oh, um, because it happened in an artistic period, it can't have been science or anything like that. It isn't, it isn't like that. It's a much sort of softer aesthetic view that sees these cycles. And I think something similar about um, astrological cycles, people sometimes, particularly if they're being critical of them, they want some precise uh, measure of a cycle. You know, that um, you know, Saturn is in Capricorn. Well, what's going to happen? You know, um, will Russia win the war or something like that? You know, um, whereas to me, it's much more like, again, like the weather. If you say, am I going to get wet tomorrow? You could say, well, it's going to rain, but if you take an umbrella, you might not get wet. You know, I mean, it's, so, it's like that. You, you can't make those hard and fast predictions. And so that's um, uh, the way I tend to see astrological predictions. They're very easy to look back and see how they fitted and to find explanations for things that have happened. It isn't very easy to make predictions forward. And one that I think is very interesting is the process of Pluto into Capricorn. And Liz Green wrote about that years ago. She said that in her mind, this was in, she's writing about 1980, I think. She said that Capricorn relates to uh, our view of what material reality is a solid feel of this is what's real. And Pluto coming into Capricorn um, is a very sort of a powerful shakeup. And it is, when did it come in? I don't know about, um, let me think, less than 10 years ago, I think it was. It's that sort of timing. The view of what is the nature of physical reality has shifted a lot. There are these ideas that actually what we think of as the real world when we touch it is actually a construct of the brain. It's a virtual reality created by the brain, which means that the whole question of what is really there 
comes into doubt. Now, the very idea that the, we're living in a virtual reality created the brain comes from scientists who do, who've traced you know, nerve signals along our arms into the brain and nerve signals from the eyes and from the ears and so on and so forth. But of course, they only know that from their own observations and shared ideas. In other words, that idea was formed in their own brains and it just becomes accepted by people. So this really has sort of um, shaken up our feeling of the solidity of the universe. It feels dead solid. You know, I can thump the table and say, this is real. But I know that I'm actually experiencing virtual reality made inside my brain. And I only know about that virtual reality because other people's virtual reality have come up with the idea that it's a virtual reality. It's sort of, you know, what happens now? Where are we going? And the interesting thing for me is that um, as Pluto is, a, is going to leave fairly soon, it's going to leave and move on to Aquarius. What is Aquarius about? Well, it's very much about democracy, equality, humanity, you know, we're all one and all that sort of thing. That's a very Aquarius idea. Well, if Pluto is going to have a similarly corrosive effect, does that mean that um, Trump is going to become the president of America and the sort of Western democratic thing is going to break up? Um, uh, I can't make that as a prediction, but if that did happen, we would look back and say, wow, that really fitted Pluto entering Aquarius, a sort of you know, a breakdown of the of the democratic principles and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, it's pure speculation, but I've um, that's how I tend to look at cycles. You know, uh, is there a pattern there? Is there sort of something we could recognize? And um, what does it tell us? It says things that might happen. The following, you know, it gives a, a pointer to what might happen. There's one example I referred to in Thunder Squeak, um, where Liz Green was talking about uh, the way the shadow, the, the female, the, the free female, the unmarried female, suffered a sort of shadow projection throughout the age of Pisces. And um, you see that at its worst in the burning of witches, but it goes right through society. You know, the suspicion people have about a lonely woman who isn't part of the fold. Um, the pressure in a family that a girl must marry in order to be a proper woman and all that sort of thing. Um, through many, over the centuries and through many cultures, there's something considered to be sort of dangerous about a woman who is free and independent. And she described that in terms of Virgo uh, is the opposite sign to Pisces. And she's bigger Jungian is very much into the idea of the shadow, uh, shadow figure, which can be projected as something evil and sinister. And so she said, Virgo, which we think means just a woman who hasn't had sex, actually meant a woman that wasn't attached, a free independent woman, not related to a man. And that's the figure that took this you know, sort of shadow projection. Now, in Thunder's Week, I said, well, what would be, if we're entering the age of Aquarius, what is the shadow figure for that? And the opposite sign is Leo, very much the sign of the individual, um, the king in his own king, kingdom sort of thing. And so uh, I said that I think the big challenge in the, coming age of Aquarius will be the individual versus society, the loner versus the group. And I've really seen that um, in over the years and news items. When you get a big sort of like a, a school shootout, the press rushes to interview people. What was this guy like? And the phrase that comes up again and again, well, he was a bit of a loner. You know, 
And I think that this sort of idea builds up of someone who's a loner who stands out. That's dangerous. You know? um, so I see that projection happening quite a big way. And at another level, you could say um, if uh, Aquarius represents democracy, humanism, freedom, equality, all those things, the opposite being Leo is the king, the dictator. And then to me, I think of um, what Liz Truss said about, you know, we're entering an age where democracy is under threat from dictatorships all around the world and authoritarian regimes. And to me, that just sounds like, you know, um, Aquarius and the projection of the shadow onto, onto um, Leo, you know. So uh, I see that tension starting, and I think it's going to be a very big tension for a long time to come. And maybe a crisis point will be when Pluto goes through Aquarius. So very soft thinking, but it's a, it, you're, you're sort of make, you're predicting the weather perhaps, saying, uh, look out for what happens in this area. Yeah, so cycles, um, I can see them and I find them interesting, but I'm very hesitant to make any clear predictions about changes, you know, and this, what's going to happen in the future. Because I know that um, science, religion, magic and art, none of them are brilliant at predicting. Um, they all have a go and in many ways they fail. It's whether they fail interestingly, really, that's, that's the thing. That's fascinating indeed. And what sorts of implications does a, a tension between Aquarius projecting shadow onto Leo? Mm. Uh, well, I th I I think the, yeah I can see signs of it in many different ways. Um, you've got uh, the internet and so social media is a very very Aquarian thing. You know, um, everyone can be linked instantly and done electronically, which is also sort of very Aquarian. So you could say that's a very good example of. Um, rise of uh, age of Aquarius and the new technology. Uh, but it has a terrific power for demonizing people. Once someone has been sort of, uh, um, well, I can't remember what the word is, you know, um, trolled for being fat or something like that, they could find the whole school turning against them um, in, in a very short time. And uh, celebrities who um, make a faux pas or somehow go out of fashion. You know, there's this huge trashing thing that happens. And it's very much a group, a group trashing someone who they made into an outsider. And so that to me is a very obvious sort of symptom of this. Um, I, yes, I think for things like, taking it up to the level of a war, or civil war, say, if society decides that a certain type of person is an outsider, is projects a shadow onto them, then you could, that might be what's happening in America. The Trump supporters focus on the woke as the trouble. You know, these are the people causing all the problems, this and the other, we must and, and many politicians say, I'm going to combat this woke movement, all that. And that's a sort of demonizing. Um, and of course, it could work the other way. Uh, you get a lot of articles written about those stupid Trump supporters, you know, uh, thick headed idiots, and all that sort of thing. Um, and it's people forming an association which then attacks outside that association. And I think that's, um, uh, it fits that idea of demonizing the other, picking on individuals and, and criticizing them. Now it's not that that hasn't always been a tendency in society, but so what is different now? I think it's that the internet and 
social media makes it happen so quickly. Uh, you know, ideas used to walk, go around the world at walking pace. Um, but now, if I say something which offends people, uh, I can get this reaction the same day from all around the world. And that's, um, yeah, so that's the sort of way I see it working out. One country might decide that another country is something wrong with it. I mean, you could say, I mean, I'm stretching it a bit, but Russia, Putin deciding that um, Ukraine, which was meant to be part of Russia, according to his theory, has gone Nazi, you know. And so um, uh, he's seeing himself as the Union of Soviet Social Republics thing, you know, uh, we're the socialists. And those are the Nazis you know, that we must get rid of. And as far as I'm concerned, that's an illusion, but it's a, again, it's a projection on uh, the one that stands out, the one that's different, the one that's beginning to go towards the West in its ideas. Now, it's ironical, of course, because we would see it as um, Ukraine is the, the um, democracy, the free place, that sort of thing, being attacked by Russia. So you can look at it either way, but it is that same instinct to point the finger at the at the outsider and say that he's a dictator, and the other says he's a Nazi. If... Well, often when this sort of a discussion occurs, the word polarizing, polarization is brought up, mm. and uh, the dangers of othering mm. um, is that one, in fact, creates an opposing body. Yeah. And I think this has some, perhaps some link to uh, the way in which you discuss egregores. Yes. In creating a certain situation mm -hmm. for one purpose, one might find that the situation takes on a life of its own mm -hmm. and other, other consequences follow. Yes. Do you see, uh, do you see any link between the sorts of things you're talking about, which is an example of the possible projection of shadow from Aquarius to Leo. Um, mm. Do you uh, see any links there between what you're talking about and, and this idea of egregores? Well, when you say it, it's a, it, you know, it fits very well. What egregores does, it provides a sort of a terminology, you know, that um, the people who think they're in the in group, they're actually forming an egregore. And I say forming an egregore because, of course, it can also work that the egregore is already there, but people are sort of joining it. You know, like um, if someone decides, uh, um, you know, he sort of discovers Nazism and it really moves him and he wants to be part of it. Nazism was already there as an idea, but he's joining it. But if a group of people um, come along across similar ideas, you know, they start saying, well, we you know we hate Jews and we hate this, that, and the other, um, then they're sort of rebuilding Nazism, but actually it connects up to the egregore. Sooner or later, they'll find the books, you know, and they realize that they've joined something which already exists. So you can think of forming an egregore or joining an egregore, and it's very, the two things sort of happen. It's a mixture of the two things. Now, I'm very interested as to why we so readily fall into these um, polarizations. And I'm beginning to think that it's very, it's, it's a fundamental thing that the brain, how we cope. If the brain is creating this real world, it feels so solid. And if it is doing so, so that we can live and survive. And to explain that, if you take LSD or psychedelic, this solid real world begins to sort of flow and merge and everything like that. It, it loses that, those sharp edges, those boundaries. Um, and it could be that that is closer to what reality is. In other words, a moving, flowing mass of interconnecting things, everything connected. But if a, an entity is going to survive in that chaos, it needs not to see all that stuff it needs to have it 
channeled down into solid objects which behave themselves. And that is what the brain is doing. It's giving us this, what looks like a real world. And I give the analogy that um, in a computer, if you go to terminal mode, it's a flow of words and languages and all that sort of thing. It's just going on continually. And if you try to actually use a computer to do work in that world, it'd be almost impossible. You know, you would have to sort of put all your, you'd have to use ASCII code to get the, the letters and you would have to store things in memories, which you'd have to define and so on and so forth. You know, it'd be hopeless. Whereas if it gives you a desktop, then it's all very straightforward. I open Word, I type in a document, and there it is, a file, I file it away in the right place. It's made a solid world for us. And I think the brain may be doing something similar. So having clear boundaries where they don't really exist make, splits our world up into things, solid things that we could deal with. And so that process is to split a continuum and say there's the left side and there's the right side. Uh, things are hot or they're cold. Um, people are right wing or left wing. People are black or white. Whereas if you look at the skin color gradation, there's everything in between, you know. And so um, what is done by the brain to give us a, a clear workable world is an instinct which actually can go too far. I wrote a book, The Good, The Bad, The Funny, which addressed this by asking the question that if instead of our relig basic religion being God, devil, you know, a duality, God, devil, good and evil, I think there's some African religion, I think it's Aruba or some name like that. They have God, devil, trickster. And um, the, some people, when I talked about this book, they said, oh, yes, the sensible middle point. I quite agree. You know, people forget the middle. I say, no, it's God, God, devil, trickster. It's an equilateral triangle. You have to think of those three equal forces that are working. And so when people split things into two, black, white, God, devil, good, bad, it's the trickster which is actually creating that distinction. It's fooling us. And so in this book, I tried to show that if you take your duality and you think, what is the third factor? Um, you get a system which instead of splitting out, it tends to flow. Uh, I began the book by looking at a fourfold system, um, four archetypes, you know, like earth, air, fire, water. And I looked at the archetypes of the male projections of the feminine. And you had Amazon, witch, mother, daughter. And it came from a conversation where a person was saying, you know, people, men either go for a mother figure or a daughter figure, you know, a flirty, sexy thing or a, a kind, caring thing. And I thought, actually, I don't go for either of those. I go for the Amazon because, you know, my mother was an athlete. And, and when you live in the country, and girls are not people in, in lace and f fluffy stuff. They're, they're sitting on the backs of horses looking down at you, you know. So um, for me, the essence of femininity was Amazonian. And then the opposite of that is the witch, the mysterious woman that sort of is shimmery and, and not touching the ground. So you've got these four archetypes. And that scheme tends to become stereotyping. Oh, you know, she's an obvious Amazon. Oh, she's an obvious mother figure, blah, 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 that, you know. And earth, air, far water. Oh, he's an earth type. He's a, she's an air type and so on and so forth. They crystallize out into stereotypes. But if you compare that with the threefold thing of, of the woman, um, daughter, 
mother crone. That isn't stereotypes because it's a cycle that goes round. The daughter becomes the mother, becomes the crone, and is reborn as a daughter. It's the phases of the moon. And so that, that's one example where if you go from, instead of a fourfold division, you think, think in threes, you get a system that flows rather than separating out. And you get the same thing in, in the zodiac. You say earth, air, fire, water become stereotypes. You know, he's an earth type, he's a water type, and so on. But cardinal fixed mutable is actually about ah, uh, ooh, mm. It's about the cycle of initiating, continuing, and then transforming to the next level. And um, you see, if you ask people about, astro about astrology and they don't know much, they probably know about earth, air, fire, water types. The man in the street is less likely to know about the, the cardinal fixed mutable, those qualities. And I think that um, we tend to be educated in and grow up with the twofold and fourfold, the even numbered ways of thinking. And I, in this book, I was saying, let's see if we can try to get into a threefold way of looking at things to get that flow again. So, oh, uh, many examples. I took the thing of rich and poor, rich, poor, you know, and that really separates us out, doesn't it? You know, this thinking rich people uh, are oppressing the poor. And I said, what's the trickster there? And I decided, you know, you've got to find the third thing out there. But of course, it could be anywhere out there. And I chose education. Education is the thing which plays between rich and poor. And I gave the example which came from a book called Parkinson's Law, where he gave a typical family progression in Britain. And it went like this, People, a family in London, um, very poor, they're in the East End, and they set up a business. They begin to make money, and they move out to Essex. And Essex has a famous reputation for the, the money-making you know, guy, who, a smart aleck who could make money out of anything and all that sort of thing. And they build up their business until they turn into industrialists, and they move up to the north. There they are in the north of England with their big industrial empire and their mansion, manor house they built and all that. And they send their children to Eton on Harrow. Now, the children uh, learn to despise their parents because they're nouveau riche and they get very snobby. And they go down, the, the, um, down towards Gloucestershire and the West Midlands, um, where they become sort of... Uh, uh, they spend their money on race horses and collecting and all that sort of thing and all that. And then they, they go down to Bournemouth, where you've got a lot of old people who still got precious antiques because of their past, which was their aristocrats. And then from there, they go back, their impoverished children go back to London and start the cycle again. So, so that was a sort of a funny example. But the thing is that um, the world is divided rich and poor. But education is the thing that turns that into a cycle. You know, uh, in Africa, a lot of the very, very poor black people know that if they can, even at the cost of starving, if they can get their children to have some education, that is what will get them out of the um, out of the pit. So that was really what I was exploring in that book. Um, and I argued, for instance, when England had a three-party system, and I remember, you know, when the Liberal Party was a real third party, and uh, you know, there were there were uh, certainly two Liberal newspapers: was News Chronicle, and there was the Manchester Guardian, were Liberal newspapers, you know, and, and then you've got the Telegraph and the Mirror, the the the, the Labour and the um, and the Conservative and the Labour papers. So it was, a, it was an active force. Now, I found it was interesting that um, if you think of who's the sort of the ultimate Tory buffer, you think of Winston Churchill. 
but he actually had been a liberal member of parliament and he did have some very liberal ideas i think at one stage he was saying instead of spending money on the navy we should be spending that money on the poor people who we want to bring them up to become craftsmen things like that you know the sort of so people could change and i realized if you have three parties uh if you only have two parties changing your mind could only mean betraying the other party and going to the other side it's an act of treachery but if you have three parties you could actually flow from one to the other more gracefully you know uh someone might say i'm a rigid conservative i believe in this that the other and all these things you know um uh and i believe in making money and you know that's the way things were and i don't agree with this labor nonsense about you know um, giving every equal chances because we're not equal but then he thinks of liberals talking about providing free education for everyone he thinks well actually that's rather a good thing because um you know in that way more educated people will have more business you know and we'll be we'll be better conservatives if we're all well educated and so he moves to the liberal party and then he begins to see you know the, the labor point of view and like he can he can move around it isn't just a betrayal so oh in the book i try to give many examples where i'm just exploring this idea that if we begin to think in threes we will it gets we will break those deadlocks and um uh so what i decided was that when we have these deadlocks these splits if we don't recognize the trick in them we're stuck and if there's going to be a way out it's realizing that actually there's a trick being played on us and if i think of you know, one obvious polarization in America is the Trump people versus the woke people. Now, what strikes me is what was it initially that got Trump voted? It wasn't something obvious because actually people were pretty sure he wasn't going to win. You know, all the uh, surveys and things suggest he wasn't going to win. But there was a very strong reaction against Obama. Um, the the right wing began to rise up, you know, in this sort of extremist movements of the white supremacists, really were pissed off with Obama, and they began to sort of create the ferment. And it was really was that which tipped the balance and led to Trump being elected. In other words, you could say that the mother of the Trump thing was Obama. It was he who set the stage for a Trump victory. Now, the woke movement, when did it really evolve? It was when Trump was president. Trump, with his extreme views, created the right atmosphere for people to get together and be woke. And um, so Trump, uh, you could say, was responsible for the democratic government that followed. Um, he was the one who created woke, you know. Uh, so this very clear black and white distinction between those two, it's actually a swindle. Um, the one created the other and the other tends to invoke the next one. It's, um, so if one could actually see the trick, the whole thing is not so, it's a way of sort of breaking this polarization and seeing how one is a reaction to the other and when you react you build rebuild the other one again more strongly so yeah that was um my idea of polarities that look at any one of them very closely and you'll see there's something tricky about it something that was really was a continuation a right wing left wing there are many many stages in between of people who think well that right wing idea is good but that left wing idea is also good you know all that but it begins split into two opposing camps and then you 
tend towards a war or a battle between them, when really the idea that there was two opposing camps was a trick. And um, who's the trickster? Who's pulling the strings, making it all happen? So if the brain has uh, developed this illusion of solid objects, it's a trick, but it's a very good trick. It's a very necessary trick. So that's why the trickster is equal to God and devil. Um, he's actually making our world livable. We could actually do things because we've got solid objects. Just as on the desktop, you can write an essay, you can post it, you can print it the next day. It doesn't vanish and melt away. It's still there in the file you put it in and so on and so forth. And that is what the brain is doing with whatever lies behind. It is giving us a world of nice solid objects which behave themselves. And to do that, it makes divisions. This is, this is a cup that is not a cup. This, this isn't a cup, you know. Um, this is glass that isn't glass and so on and so forth. Whereas um, if you take a psychedelic, that isn't quite so clear anymore. <laughs> and maybe that's a vision of truth, just as if you put your computer into terminal mode, you start getting all that flow of, of language. Um, maybe we're seeing what's really there or what does real mean in that case. I'm thinking now of application hmm. of these of this idea of um, cycles, for example, this idea of finding the third point, etc. Hmm. One hmm. application I can see is that one can, as an individual, have a, a new perspective on on the situation. Hmm. Uh, I'm thinking now still at that sort of societal level and hmm. find some additional insight or different ways of thinking about it, maybe some relief. So that's one level. I'm curious if you have any comment about about that. And then there's another level, which is, could somebody with an understanding of these sorts of ideas use those ideas to act on situations? So not only using them as a way to understand the situation and provide perhaps mm. a sense of relief to oneself and think, well, maybe it's not, you know, let's freeing mm. oneself from polarized thinking. But mm. could someone act on that level to free a situation from polarized thinking or yes. to plunge a situation into polarized thinking? Well, a good start that I don't know the answer, but I'll explore the idea a bit. Um, now, one thing is, can someone create that polarity? Well, very clearly, we know they can. You know, that um, uh, Putin has managed to persuade a lot of the Russian population that Ukraine, which he was claiming was part of Russia, is actually now an enemy. You know, so and the many examples you could give of that. So that is uh, is an accepted thing. You can create a polarity, and it's rather easy because it seems to be the way the mind works. You know, so we naturally slip into that. Now, can you do the sort of trick I was talking about of um, uh? getting people to see the trick and so eroding the distinction. You know, um, people are very sure there's a clear distinction here, but how do you get them to realize that actually there's something wrong with that distinction? There are exceptions. It isn't quite like that, that actually uh, we're seeing two directions, not two factions. Well, uh, one way, and this very much relates to the trickster, is humor. Um, you can make a play or a film or a story where the sort of things I've described come in in a humorous way. You know, you have the rabid Nazi and the rabid communist, and you begin to show the paradoxes in them, you know, <laughs> Well, they're, actually, they're both saying the same thing, but in different language, you know, things like that. So humor, I think, is one thing. And it's lovely because it is the trickster. You know, the trickster is a, a leg puller, a humorist. And um, so the trickster can play that role. Uh, satire, making 
the whole thing so ridiculous that people roar with laughter and they, rather than go to war. Um, so that might be one route. Um, the other, with a view of, of cycles, if I go back to that thing of cycles versus the linear view, a lot of the terror that people feel is because of the linear view. The recipe for a science fiction, I used to love reading science fiction in the 50s, or 60s, or 70s, and the recipe for a science fiction novel was to take something that's happening in society, a trend, and carry it to its limits. Like the book Fahrenheit 451 was noting that um, people were beginning to respond more and more to listening and audio than reading. You know, books, people would say, oh, I'd rather um, listen to the radio than read a book. And so it projected a future where people went around with little buds in their ears, listening to radio and music all the time, which of course happened um, later with, with um, uh, iPods and things like that. Um, and it extended that idea that reading was seen as anti-society. And so books were being burnt. And so Fahrenheit 451, that's the temperature at which paper burns. And that was the theme of the book. Um, in other words, you take something that's happening and you extend it and it becomes frightening. So I think people tend to do that. Um, uh, the rise of the opioids. Well, if that just, if that isn't stopped, you know, the whole world is just going to be drugged, um, you know, begin with babies, don't want them to feel pain, so you drug them right from the beginning and so all through their lives. You create a science fiction scenario, which is scary. Now, if you think more in terms of cycles, um, the question becomes is how does humanity, which thinking magically, Humanity is a living entity. It's a egregore, if you like. How does it respond to things? And it responds in a living way. So rather than thinking the path we're going down will mean even babies will be given opioids at birth, um, you know that actually reactions build it, come in. I gave one example early on where I said, you know, have science telling us so much what we can't do. You can't do that. You can't do that. Well, people rebel and say, well, I want to do it. You know, I want magic. I'm going to do it. Um, similar things would happen. You know, in the 50s, uh, there was a festival of Britain to celebrate when Britain began to sort of get out of the wartime ruin. It was in the economic ruin. They held a festival of Britain. And it celebrated the new world, the new technology, the things that were going to happen. And one of the wonderful demonstrations they gave of what the future promises was battery chickens. Huge battery things with automated um, battery chickens. Now, uh, you could look at that and think, oh my God, I'm going to write a science fiction story about a, a future when farms are all in sheds. There's no green fields, this, that, the other. And it's a very scary and likely thing, except there was the organic movement, rebe rebellion against it. Um, and so uh, in terms of what is likely to happen, um, well, a very obvious example is the destruction of the environment and, and, and um, global warming. Well, there's been a reaction to that. Now, whether that reaction is strong enough and is actually going to manage to turn the tide, one cannot predict. But um, it is a human thing that human nature will try to break that cycle in some way. Whether it succeeds or not, I mean, I very much hope it does. But uh, just to say, endless um, industrialization means we're just going to go along this path we can't stop is a scary thing to think but it isn't actually realistic 
in terms of we are society, humanity is a living thing, living on the earth, which is itself a living thing. And the interactions between living things are very complicated and not so easy to predict. Now, that does raise the question whether an artificial intelligence might do better than, than we do. Um, we automatically split things into twos. Might an artificial intelligence uh, realize that this splitting into two is an illusion? There's always a trick there somewhere. And um, so it could make more realistic predictions because it knows that humanity is a reactive thing and that um, a certain negative trend, which looks as though it's justified economically, it's justified, you know, that this is the way things must be, but a reaction will set in. Uh, would an artificial intelligence be better at anticipating that by looking at past examples? Um, and uh, maybe be able to make better predictions and maybe even better find solutions by seeing when the reaction could be encouraged uh, before it's too late. I'm only, as I say, speculating, I'm only exploring, but I would think along those lines that, uh, yeah, I don't know. Have I provided, say initially I said, I don't know, but um, I've explored and come up with some ideas. Yes, it's very interesting indeed. And, uh, you know, magic is about many things, but one of the things that magic seems to be about is uh, taking these sorts of insights and applying them in to, to create some sort of effect. That That's mm -hmm. at least something that is commonly associated with magic, that kind of an idea. Yeah. And one of the uh, cliches, I think, or commonly thought things about magic, when it comes to the level that you're now talking about, the sort of societal level of international mm -hmm. relations and so on, is that people with magical insight are either consulted or one way or another mm. applying magical insight at, at that level to uh, direct or influence events. Mm. Now, maybe that starts to sound like a science fiction mm. novel or a fantasy mm. novel as I describe it, mm. but it's a common idea, I think. Um, mm. I wonder what do you think of that idea? Does that sort of thing happen in your in your opinion? Uh, of course, by your definition of magical mm. thinking, it 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 almost inevitably does. The person doesn't mm. even necessarily have to think of themselves as a magician to apply magical thinking. Yes, yes, yes. So, by your definitions, of course, inevitably it must. Uh, mm. But what do you think of that sort of an idea? Well, I think it's in the introduction to Sosopomy, um, S S O T B M E. I point out that. Um, I draw a comparison with advertising and marketing with magic. And um, that, of course, is very much used by politicians and people wanting to make changes or to sell things. That you use magical images and associations so that uh, if I think of an advertisement for Rolex watches, say, Rather than saying in words, if you have a Rolex, people will think you're rich and they'll respect you. What you do is you show a yacht, obviously on the Mediterranean with beautiful women having a wildly lovely time. And there's a handsome man, very tanned and everything with a Rolex watch, you know, and, um, and you just sort of say, then you think of a phrase like, um, uh, um, I don't know. Beauty, uh, beauty is a right, not a privilege. Yeah, I've just invented a phrase. Yeah, just goes along with what beauty is a right, not a privilege, or something like that. Um, precision and beauty. Or, um, and the really you're presenting it as a talisman. You know, this is this isn't just a watch. It's a talisman for wealth and respect and admiration. And uh, 
So, you know, similarly, you'll tell a, a teenage audience that a certain make of T-shirt, which is just really very much the same as every other one, but it's got a logo on it. This is a talisman and it'll sell well. So you could see that sort of principle, you can see that in every remark that politicians make. The, the, the conservative politician who says, um, I will make a stand against this woke culture. You don't know, he, he probably won't do anything or, you know, nothing effective, but he's getting people to say, oh, that's the sort of person I want. Yes, you know, can't stand this woke culture. We're going in the right direction with him. It's, um, uh, they are, I would say, doing, you know, using magic. Now, the question is how consciously, well, some of them will have read books. They're not likely to be books with titles like Sex Secrets of the Black Magicians Exposed, but they might be um, the winning idea, the key to successful leadership. And really, it's telling you to do that. You know, the winning idea. Get your idea, boil it down to a simple image and a word, and then use that word and that image until people get it. You know, they're really telling you how to charge a talisman um, or an incantation. So uh, there's that level. Now, some people, and I think this has been very interestingly described, if I remember rightly, on the Magic Me website, um, that. Uh, I've heard it said that Trump read a certain amount of those books in the past when he was young, you know, how to influence people, how to make friends influence people, and also going more, a bit more in the occult direction. In other words, there is a theory that he actually uh, learned some of these tricks, magical tricks, and was using them. Now, I put I've, I've mentioned that because it is it's some people have been saying that I haven't bothered to find out for myself whether it's true or not, um, but it it's an example of people thinking that this might have happened a little more conscious than just the Tory politician who decides to um, you know say he's unwoke. <laughs> and then um, whether you could have a mastermind really influencing the world you get this idea that there's the illuminati you know that these people who are doing this now the big trouble for um that sort of idea for me you know the great conspiracy which is directing our world is that it doesn't allow enough for human ability to make absolute cock-ups, you know, to, to movements which break down if people get in each other's throats, particularly when power is involved. People who are rather powerless get together with an interesting idea and they can really can work on it and they can, they can build it up. But when they all become very powerful, I don't know that humans are good at handling that. I mean, um, one of the best people who managed it was Adolf Hitler. He really carried it very, very far. It wasn't that there weren't some people in his government who actually didn't agree with him and were looking for an opportunity to sabotage it. And as to its ultimate effectiveness, it didn't work because he himself began to believe his own myth. So he wouldn't listen to advisors who said that actually uh, the German Air Force needs fighter jets more than it needs bombers. We should change our, our, um, you know, our priorities. And he said, no, 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 we're not going to be defending, we're attacking, we're attacking, we want bombers. And that helped Germany to lose the war. So, yeah, I... There was this debate about the Rosicrucian idea, which the 
myth was that this is passed down from the ancient Egyptians and even earlier, it's this timeless wisdom passed down by a few elect people. Against that was uh, the Golden Dawn. Alec Howe said, actually, it was um, a few clever people who studied old manuscripts in the, um, in the British Museum Library and created this sort of uh, semi-Masonic idea of a secret society which bring, has handed down things from generations. Now, that was seen as the uh, damning version of the Golden Dawn, whereas that it was a timeless movement that had gone right back to the past, <clears throat> was seen as the pro-Golden Dawn movement. But I, I sort of, I suppose I did a trickster on it by saying, actually, I cannot believe from what I know of human nature that anyone would successfully pass down a continuous line of wisdom from ancient Egypt to now. But someone, I do believe that someone might go back and read things from the past and then build up a knowledge of the past and would carry a much purer egregore, if you like, of from the past to the present and then set it going again. In other words, I almost saw that as a, a purer um, uh, her inheritance than some group of people, one after the other, passing it down. God, how did I get onto that? Oh, yes, it's, it's this idea of, you know, the, the master uh, secret society which rules the world. I'd like to think that that's possible, but human nature tells me that it's going to crack up. That probably, again, we could put it in terms of, um, of uh, what the brain does, what the brain has built in order to, for us to survive. You know, what are the characteristics, the DNA of humanity? Um, and I think it is a certain, built in as a certain destructive impulse that will never let anything be too perfect because something too perfect leads to stasis. And the nature of life is always to be evolving. And so, yeah, perfection is anti-life. Uh, life always moves towards it, but if ever it was reached, that would be the end of life. You know? sort of, um, could see it in those terms. Uh, yeah, again, I sort of explored around the idea. And mm, basically, yeah. I'm saying that um, I, it's very attractive, the idea of being able to manipulate through a knowledge of magic. And you can see examples of people doing that. But whether it could be ultimately done in order to direct humanity, I don't think so. Yes, it's very interesting to hear you talk about these things. And you're talking also about the conscious and the unconscious. And this idea of directing fate and then perhaps finding oneself directed by fate. I think of Oedipus Rex, for example, that sort of a situation. <laughs> um, and I think one of the efficacies of this exploring these sorts of ideas is it has the possibility of snapping one out of um, the unconscious uh, playing out of some of these patterns, maybe giving a little bit of uh, insight or maneuverability there. So I'm wondering in terms of two applications, seeing as we're talking about applications now, two applications, one is for the individual. We have this idea of personal cycles and then this idea of the cycles as they apply to society, fashion and thought and that sort of thing. And both of these are moving. I wonder if they may have different relationships to each other. So for example, one person might be in magical whilst a magical phase, whilst society is in an artistic phase or scientific mm -hmm. phase or something like that. Yeah. So I'm wondering if there are relationships between those that some go together, some are in opposition. Um, mm. uh, uh, what, what sort of relationships you, you might see between the personal 
yeah. in these phases in the societal. And then the other application that's a bit similar to that, which is a bit different again, is you talk about this idea of playing the compass. Mm. Uh, well, I'll quote you. You say, if you want to irritate the speaker, question his ideas from the perspective of the previous quadrant. To offend or disturb, use the opposite quadrant. To intrigue and simulate, <laughs> use the following quadrant. Oh, so this is, this is sort of an interpersonal oh, that's application. Clever. Where, where, where did I say that? That's, that's dead clever. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. That, that's in Sex Secrets, actually. Yeah. Oh, right. Of course. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of a cool idea on the interpersonal mm. level, catching what mode someone's in and then mm. with this insight, yes. being able to uh, relate mm. and animate different modes in oneself to achieve certain mm. effects. That's an application. Um, yeah. And then also how one's the phase that one is in might relate to the societal phase. Mm. So these are two sets of relationships. Yes. Again, I'm going to sort of explore it. Um, one thing is uh, that can't say now that I, I'm really smoothly going through those phases in a way that was very obvious when I was when I was young, you know, that up to teenager and then go to university. It was very clear. Um, it becomes more blurred after that, uh, partly because I began to make my choices, you know, that I like the magical thinking. And so um, even when I got to, let me think, you know, the next lot of, of having to be a bit more scientific perhaps you, perhaps that was when i had to go and earn my living um as a, a computer programmer or rather a mathematical modeler for computers maybe i was teaching my i was having to think more scientifically then but i still was interested in magic and i was um uh you know talking about it with my friends at that point so but i do remember a time when um I seem to go very dead on the magic. Uh, that, and I, other people have felt this, you know, that um, somehow you were no longer felt moved to use tarot cards, this, that, the other. The world seemed very dry, and um, the magic had bleed, bled out of it. Now, I did something that was quite interesting, and some other people have responded to this. I developed a sort of mantra. Um, there is no magic, there are no gods. And so I really lived that, repeated that to myself. Forget all that stuff, you know. Don't go out and look at the moon and talk to it, that sort of thing. There is no magic, there are no gods. It's all rubbish. And it had quite an interesting effect because um, it was as if, with my thinking about magic and sort of practicing it, everything, I was putting magic out into the world um, and making it a magical place. I remember beautiful things of walking. I was in Winchester, walking up to an old sacred site where there was a maze, you know, and walking in the maze and the full moon and things like that. Very sort of down fortune, magical things. And um, what uh, I discovered through doing this very harsh thing of saying, no, there is no magic, you know, just my imagination, load of rubbish, was that the magic that I'd put out into the world sort of began to flow back into me. Um, that, yeah, and sort of, so it was reborn inside me. Now, I haven't really bothered to think of that in terms of cycles, whether it was a point where at the end of a, um, a sort of dry scientific cycle, I was moving to a magical one. But it was, it had that effect that uh, um, I don't, as it were, put all, everything out into the world, you know, everything's magical, everything's wonderful and all that. And then dried out myself, that a very dryness actually sucked it back in. Now, what does that relate to? Well, when that happened, it was actually at the height of um, the 80s sort of artistic phase, you know, where everyone was yuppies and making money. 
Have you seen on Netflix the series Painkiller? Have you watched that? Um, I haven't. <clears throat> that's that's about the the uh, the birth of the opioid frenzy, and it shows you what is instantly recognised as a very eighties thing. It's a company setting out to make money in a big way. It's it's it, recruiting attractive girls to go and speak to doctors and persuade them they must administer this medicine. They're, it's a magical act of like they're thinking up phrases. Um, uh, you know, we're saving humanity from pain. We're rescuing humanity. Pain is the enemy. We will conquer it. Um, and they're making little furry models of, of the blue pill um, with a smiley face on it for children to play with and things like that. They're doing all the sort of magical promotion stuff. And you see them holding uh, sort of marketing meetings where you know, balloons are going up, they're shouting, they're chanting slogans all in time, you know, this, that, the other. Um, away with pain, away with pain. Oxycontin is the thing and all sort of yes, stuff. Um, and it's a great big sort of uh, magical celebration. And that was the height of that 80s, um, uh, you know, art form stuff, you know, that every, style was everything, you know, and, and what people wore and you wanted money so you could buy it, all that type of thing. And it was, it was, um, yeah, absolutely the height of that. And it was during that that I had this experience of um, I'd put all the magic out and I needed to get it back into myself. So I don't know if I can see a connection there or not. I think I think I was running my own my own clock at my own speed at that point. Yeah. In general, um I mean, if you think of the time during the uh, 2000, say 2015 or so, when the sceptical movement was very, very strong, uh, I think a lot of people, a lot of magicians were still getting on with it then. Um, I know chaos magic really became a big thing towards the end of that, as though that was part of the moving on from the sceptical movement. Um, I mean, we still held philemic conferences and things at that time, so the, the pot was boiling. And, mm. But then, of course, I could look at it in terms of the slower cycle, where uh, at the 500-year cycle, you know, um, leading up to the Victorian age was really the peak of materialist science which began to crack up a bit with the coming of quantum theory and things like that. Um, and in those terms, we were coming to the end of the materialist science phase and moving into more magical thinking. And I, you know, give examples like Crowley's Book of the Law, Jungian theory beginning, um, quantum theory, things like that, which sort of break that rigid materialist certainty. And in those terms, we are in an increasingly magical thinking age. And that the things that happen in the sort of short term cycle are all in the light of that. So whereas in the 50s, it was very skeptical and it was very odd not to be a skeptic. By the early 2000s, skepticism was a sort of a movement, a very successful movement, but it was a thing you could join or if you didn't, you were not a skeptic. You know, it wasn't so um, compelling as it was in the 50s to be a skeptic. So it, the magical thinking was on the rise slowly. I gave, I, I gave the analogy once of, you know, uh, these waves, there's the beach, and these waves come in and retreat, they come in and retreat. You think, ah, oh, yes, that's the cycle, yes. You know, 15 years of this, and then it'll be 15 years of the next 15 years. But there's also the tide, which is slower. You begin to notice the waves actually going a bit further each time, you see. And so 
for me, the tide is the, is the rise of magical thinking, um, post science times. Uh, but these waves, which we've been talking about, you know, of, um, the skeptical period, and now we're in magical thinking period, is a, a faster phenomenon, uh, a more obvious one in some ways. That's very interesting indeed. The I think another advantage of this sort of a lens, this sort of a way of thinking, and I do appreciate it's it's, and you've made that point. It's a way of thinking about things. It's not necessarily, yeah, you know, to recognize that things change. As we come back to Heraclitus, the only constant is change, mm. and that something that's is interesting about movements like the skeptic movement, for example, trying to we could say conquer religion permanently trying to usher in a kind of a more skeptical, rational way of thinking about things permanently. Mm. And when things are going well, to think, gosh, we're winning. Mm. Yeah. It'll yeah. always be like this. We're on top. And how, and how that can change and flip and invert yeah. in, and in the most surprising yeah. and that's, ironic uh, ways sometimes. That, that, that's, you know, sort of we're winning and this is, you know, we are the future now. Is very much an example of you know where linear thinking comes back you know um this is where we're going now we're winning the argument um soon they'll start banning books on magic you know and um people will feel ashamed to be thinking about it that sort of thing they they think they're setting the future course of how things are going to go but actually it changes you know and uh, a reaction sets in and um yeah to come back to this idea of playing the compass, and I'll read that quote again. You say, if you want to irritate the speaker, this is an interpersonal thing. If you want to irritate the speaker, question his ideas from the perspective of the previous quadrant. To offend or disturb, use the opposite quadrant. To intrigue and stimulate, use the following quadrant. Oh, yes. I wonder if you might explain a little bit those, those relationships. It reminds me a little bit of other um, sort of astrological relationships, for example, in yeah. Chinese astrology, yeah, the interaction between one's own birth animal and an element with the one that the year is, and and also the, the interactions between those sorts of astro astrological points in interpersonal relationships. So this is like a relational style, actually. This is a <laughs> style of communication you're proposing here, using these using these modes. I wonder if you wow. might expand on that a bit. God. I have to get my thinking back to when I wrote that. Now, to irritate, you go to the one before. That makes sense, right. I think, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So to a scientist um, uh, who is very excited about, you know, he's got a new painkiller and things like that, um, you would put a rather religious question. But are we meant to avoid pain? I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, um, or... Uh, Stem yeah, cell research. Yeah. Yes, that's it. Sort of, um, are we playing God? You know, um, do you think we're going to end up with all children being identical because we've all optimized them and things like that? Um, that's pretty irritating, I think. Now, um, if I go forward, now what was the one of go you go forward is to intrigue and stimulate intrigue. because that's presumably yes. what's on the tip of the tongue, isn't it? That's what's ah, coming. yes, that's it. Yes, so in the case of painkillers, yes, painkillers. We can stop pain if we give them this tablet, which we've just invented. I say, yeah, but um, do people really just want to avoid pain or would they rather have bliss? What could you find that will give people a bliss? Bring them joy, you know, not just get rid of pain. That's so negative. In other words, <laughs> take them as a psychedelic revolution, if you like. Um, uh, bring back magic to their lives. Yeah. Um, so that's it. And then the other one is opposite. What was that? That was to... To offend or disturb. Offend or disturb. Yeah, I think I, think, um, I would go to art and say, if there's no pain, there'll be no literature, there'll be no more operas, there'll be no more magic, no more films, nothing. You know, this is really boring what you're doing. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty irritating, isn't it? <laughs> So I now to think of some of the other ones. Let's let's try art. Um, uh, oh yes, so someone's made a fabulous new film, um, a new film about 
uh, well, let's say the series, the Viking series, things like that, you know, um, trying to reconstruct what actually was happened and putting it in dramatic, it's interesting form, with lots of interesting ideas in it. Now, to irritate them, I would go scientific. I would say, have you actually got evidence that they had were able to build boats like that at that time? Because I think there's some evidence that they couldn't have done that. The evidence that they got to America is very dubious, you know, and um, it hasn't really been confirmed. I would start picking at um, the truthfulness, you know, the exactness of what they're doing, which would be very irritating because they've made a really interesting thing. And they haven't made, uh, you know, they made a point of saying this is a reconstruction, but it is based loosely on historical facts. And now I'm picking it to pieces. Um, if I go forward to the religious thing, I go to intrigue them by saying, it's fascinating how the relationship between the pagan ideas and the Christian ideas, and how, and this is actually something I talked about in one of my things, how um, uh, you begin with in watching your thing of the idea of there's this brave, Viking thing, you know, champion warriors. They're really in the world, you know, they, they, they're they getting things done, you know, they're finding new countries, things like that. And then compared with that, the Christians come over, you know, particularly the ones um, the first, they first come across in, uh, uh, in that monastery, you know, it's sort of, they're like rabbits or be shooting fish in a barrel, you know, they're so helpless, they can't defend themselves, this, that, the other. And yet, it's interesting how um, the Christians, once they really sort of got back to their deity, they fought like crazy, you know. Um, so it's it's like uh, they got back to their uh, their inner warriors through meeting the Vikings, you know. It, it's as interesting as how religions evolve and all that, and I think they would find that rather intriguing. And they'd say, yeah, we'd like to do a series which really sort of focuses on that, perhaps, you know, take an individual and he'll talk through his changes in him as he becomes a Viking and then as he goes back to his Christianity. You know? um, so I think that would be quite intriguing. <laughs> now, uh, going back to annoy them. Oh, yes, to annoy them, I would say, uh, oh, you've made a wonderful talisman for getting bums on seats, haven't you? Yeah, you've put in violence, you've put in um, uh, brave people, you've put in the equivalent of Nazis, you've got nasty people and things like that. Yeah, you put all the elements in there, a lovely talisman for getting bums on seats. Well done, you know, <laughs> you should make a lot of money out of that one. And, and I think that's pretty insulting. <laughs> yes. Hmm. Yeah, I think if I think about it, I could apply that. It's just that I haven't thought about it for a very long time and I'd forgotten I'd said it. Mm. Yeah, it's very cool. Very interesting indeed. <laughs> okay, so my last question on this, as we perhaps coming towards the end of our time, and thank you, you've been very generous with your time. I don't know if this is a bit of a curveball or or if it's if it naturally follows. I'm I can't quite decide. But you know, we're talking about cycles, we're talking about cycles of society, we're talking about even cycles of life and cycles of fashion, etc. What are the options to relate to these, these cycles? I think, for example, of the hermits and the, 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 the eremitic approach, mm -hmm. this instinct of, of the hermit. I think I have quite a strong hermit instinct, you know, in me. You're on That's, a long boat. <laughs> yeah, it's a... It's sort of, I think that's my calling in a way. Mm. There's that. Uh, there, are, there are other kinds of instincts, I suppose, other strategies. For example, I suppose trying to save the world maybe is one. Mm. Or trying to take advantage of the situation, get in, in line with what's, what's the way things are and get on that train and so on, get on the bandwagon, etc. Or oppose the bandwagon for mm. similar to seek similar outcomes. Maybe all of these are seeking the same outcome. So I'm wondering, mm. what are the options in dealing with this? Because of the free form of the way you interview, it's been me exploring very much. 
not really knowing if what I'm saying is right and whether I'm going to contradict it in the next sentence, things like that. Very much exploring ideas together. And I've tried to emphasize that although I, be, I say believe in cycles, I, I recognize cycles and I think they are a factor and can't be ignored. I've tried to point out that they're not like clockwork, you know, that, that they are flows like weather. And um, so if I try to think of, if I was somebody to say, how should I approach these? I would think of what I said about the waves which come in the waves come in and there's the, the bigger wave which is the swell and then there's the tide um i would say that the right approach is not so much cerebral of what should i do you know should i make a graph of um things like that but think of the physical motion the surfer does a surfer is on the way and he's very much you could say at one level is very much the victim of those waves. You know, if there isn't a big wave coming in, he can't do it. But when a big wave comes in, he actually makes a lot of decisions based not just on this one wave, but what is likely to happen, which it takes in many other factors. And I think that, so the first thing is sort of recognize that there are these waves and explore them a little bit, probably individually, take this cycle and look at it. You know, they take this cycle and look at it. Um, are they really the same thing happening at different speeds? See, can you line them up? Oh, yes, it is something similar but at different speeds, things like that. So explore them like that. And then can you get your mind working in that sort of intuitive, I think people would call it a right brain, left brain distinction. They would say it's a right brain way of rather than trying to work it out, trying to sort of ride with it, to surf the experience. And um, I think I would suggest along those lines. Well, thank you very much. This has been so fascinating. I think I must petition you for a triptych. <laughs> because I know, <laughs> I know. Uh, I'll, I'll have tremendous. to have a little list list of things I've said so I don't say them again. <laughs> exactly. Well, I think we we were in little danger of repeating ourselves here. In particular, there there's there's a strand of of your thought that I'd like to explore again if we if we do meet for a third, which I would request. But you know, of course, we'll see. Uh, and that's this book, How to See Fairies. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, yeah. This is a bit of a change of pace. Discover your psychic powers in six weeks. A sort of how to well it says it all really how to awaken or access uh certain ways of uh, perceiving or uh, moving and working and so on that's a very fascinating book and it raises all kinds of interesting questions and i think leads quite naturally into some of the themes of the abremelin mm. diaries also which is your magical diary of a period in your life where you engaged in the famous um Abramelin working mm. um, with the Mathers translation, I think you used, mm. and very interesting indeed. And so that's another. I think those those two uh, topics go well together and are very fascinating indeed, and really rather different to what we've talked about so far. But <laughs> in any case, so that's that's my uh, that's my petition mm. <laughs> I've made there. Yes. Oh, and uh, yeah, yeah, this has been so fascinating. And thank you for uh, discussing your your thinking on cycles and exploring new ideas and thinking on the fly here for us. That's been so great to do. So thank you very much. Lionel Snell, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me and putting challenging questions to me also. I realize there's something that I missed out during the interview you had with me. Um, the question of raised of, about cycles and what's coming next or what can we expect in the near future? And I know I answered in terms of astrology and the position of Pluto, the difference between going through Capricorn and then going through Aquarius, which is what it's going to be doing soon. And I saw that in terms of, you know, the perils of democracy and coming under attack. But I did, don't think I really talked about my cycles of, you know, what happens after uh, a magical, like a wave of magical thinking. 
what follows is a sort of more like a wave of artistic thinking and then following that of religious thinking. And so what is might we expect from that? Now, I'm not very accurate about timing anything. I think probably from 2030 um, to 2035, there'll be a shift more from magical thinking to what I call artistic thinking. And I can only compare with what happened in previous times. First of all, we go back to the 19th century and there was Regency period, which was a time of very um, rich people uh, going to spas and escaping from the city in the slums and all that and having a great time and very artistic and very stylish and all that sort of thing and a lot of speculation. Um, a lot of money was made on, on new technology and um, you know building new towns and things like that and it ended with a crash. Now what happened in the, uh, the next time was really the, typified by the, the Roaring Twenties uh, where you know um, people were escaping from what had happened during the World War One, and uh, having a wild time partying. There was recreational drug taking, things like that, and that ended with the crash in the Great Depression in the thirties. And the next time really was the eighties. Now, what did they have in common? Well, the 80s again was a time of um, the yuppie movement, you know, style, people buying trendy things, spending a lot of money, and um, there was a feeling of partying. Now, why was that in those days? It was because uh, there was a real threat of nuclear annihilation at the time. The Cold War was at its height. And I think there was a sense of sort of desperation, you know, um, if the end is nigh, you know, let's live it up. And people wanted desperate to make money. That was a great thing. And it also went with um, sort of uh, political populism. Now, for me, one of the sort of things that typifies it um, in the world of music was during the hippie period and the, which, the time of magical thinking, you know, all the bands would say, of course, we're not in it for the money. You know, it's, it's the, the the beauty of making music and all that sort of thing, you know, and it's meaningful and all the spiritual stuff. Now, of course, we know a lot of that was probably was um, just uh, bullshit. But when it came to the reaction against that, with the early punk movement, people like the Sex Pistols, um, they said, that's boring old fart stuff, you know, we want to make money, you know, why can't we be rich? And even the Beatles um, produced that song, you know, the best things in this life are free. You can give that to the birds and bees. I want money. That's what I want. So there was a real sort of, um, uh, you know, spend, spend, spend and have a great time feeling about it. And um, so this is the thing that concerns me a bit, that uh, if we go into another phase like that, um, and I, I think it would probably be sort of, you know, uh, 2030s, then um, there might be that sense of desperation again. You know, environmental collapse is getting really, very likely. The heating up of the world and the sort of um, weather we are having. If people get into that mood of escapism, uh, if they start saying, well, you know, the government's trying to impose all these restrictions on us, all type of thing, and tell us to reduce energy and, and don't drive our cars. Well, it's, if it's all going to be doomed anyway, why don't we just have a good time and forget it all? You know, it's, uh, there's nothing can be done now. And so uh, I, I think it's something we should look out for, a sort of mood of, um, oh, bugger it all, you know, we've had it, let's, let's party to the end. And another thing it went with, of course, is a sort of populist, um, uh, populist politics. Uh, in the 80s, it began with Margaret Thatcher in England and um, Reagan in America. And the whole sort of uh, anti-socialism, you know, anti-being careful, anti-trying to save the environment feeling um, came flowing back then. And I hope that doesn't happen again time. <laughs> Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. 
For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.